Welcome to Complexity Made Simple and my name is Paul Allen and before we get into today's uh, fantastic video newsletter what I'd like to talk to you about is all the materials that you can purchase to help to support the channel. We've got these fantastic textbooks that range from the simple statistical process control for small batch production. We've got the seven quality tools for world-class problem solving, which is essentially yellow belt material. Then we move on to design of experiments for 21st century engineers. Every engineer and scientist needs to be able to do design of experiments. And then finally, drink tea and read the paper. The most fantastic green belt handbook you can buy on the market today. Full of practical tips and fantastic physics that'll help you become a world-class engineer and a world-class quality engineer. Of course, you can also click on the link to buy me a coffee and make a donation. That would be fantastic. But at the very least, click on subscribe, click on like the video, because it all helps to support the channel. Many thanks for your help. And now on to today's video. Welcome to the latest video. And in this video newsletter, what we're going to talk about is a practical use of hypothesis testing. So we're going to look at the O5 rule and we're going to look at a test where we go below the O5. We're going to look at a test where we stay above the O5. Just essentially, what does it mean? Okay, so we're going to just have a quick look. Now we're doing essentially a t-test. So these are the tests, hypothesis test. It's a t-test that I constantly use. I rarely use anything else, to be honest. Um, and then the p-value, 0.05. So the practical use of L5. Now what we're going to do, look, is we're going to look at a data set here. I've just got a little example and I'm just going to push this through some software. We're going to generate a p-value and we're just going to talk about what the, the p-value means. So you can see here, look, there are two data sets. So I've got nine data sets in each group. Um, we've collected the data at different temperatures. So we think the temperature will make a difference to some quality parameter in our product. I've collected nine samples at one temperature, nine samples at the other temperature. And what we have is two groups, two diagrams essentially, which are saying, well, there's two potential states we could have. The top state is that we've taken two samples from one big distribution. So in other words, the process hasn't moved we're just looking at two sample results. Well, two sample results will always look different. If I took a third sample result out of a static process, I would end up with three different results. Even a static process produces different sample results. So are we looking at sampling error, point number one at the top, or are we looking at a genuine shift, which is the diagram below, we've shifted the mean. So what we're going to do is we're going to put that data into an Excel spreadsheet. I'm going to use SPCXL in this case to do it. Um, I've put the two groups into an Excel spreadsheet. I'm going to highlight the data, go to the menu on SPCXL, and in uh, statistical tools, analytical tools. If I drop that down, it says t-test, a shift in the mean. I can select that. It then asks me which test I want to do. So whether they're just different or whether one is bigger than the other. I'm just going to ask the question, are they different? Because I don't know which way the, the shift could be taking place. So I'm just going to do the top test. I ask it to do the top test. And then of course we end up with a p-value and the p-value look 
is sitting there in the red and the P says 0 0.003. So if we put that on the board, P is 0 0.003. Now what's that telling us? Well, essentially, look, I've gone below the hurdle rate. So the rate I wanted to beat, this is your chance of being wrong if you conclude switching the temperature made a difference. Your chance of being wrong is three in a thousand. That's your chance of being wrong. That's the way I look at it. Um, so what are we going to conclude? That we have a significant shift. Now the reason why I'm saying significant is because I beat 05. Now actually I could add more words here because if I can beat 01, which I have done, then the shift is actually said to be highly significant. So that's a data set where there is a significant shift and that's your chance of being wrong. So the p-value you, that you're looking at, it's your chance of being wrong if you conclude that you created the shift with your new way of running the process. And that's the simple way to look at it. By the way, the true way to prove this is correct, of course, is to repeat the test. If this is true knowledge, every time you do this, you will create that shift or something similar. If you do it again and you don't get a good p-value, well, maybe you had a lucky day at the office. So a true test of knowledge is that you can repeat it and therefore it can be used in real life. And it wasn't just one lucky day at the office because even these p-values can go wrong and lead you astray. Can you repeat it is the true test of your experiment. Okay. So let's just change some numbers now. So I've, I've taken that number set and I've changed the numbers and we're going to make a slightly different result appear now. So now if I highlight the new data set and I do the t-test, has the mean got shifted? Let's see what we get this time. Now what we're getting, look, is a p-value which is... Um, 07 okay which is 07 now that's just above our significant level now what does this mean well it sort of means close but no cigar at this point but would I give up would I give up at this point because Ronald Fisher who sort of invented hypothesis testing. Fisher, in his book, um, Statistics for Experimenters, he never specified this value. He never said 05 is significant. There are rules that we've put into science and to engineering since Fisher. Probably Fisher would go, yeah, okay, that's, that's close enough, that's good enough. But we're used to using this L5 rule. So what would I do? Well, it's back to the same point. If you really think there's only a 7% chance you're wrong that shift in the temperature made a difference here or didn't, you know, it wasn't the shift in the temperature. It was a lucky day at the office. So there's only a 7% chance you're wrong that the new temperature is moving the process. If that's real knowledge, do it again. Do the test again. What you'll tend to find is if this was a lucky day at the office, you can't be that lucky again and the p-value will fly away from you and you'll go up to 020 or 030 or something like that and you'll lose, you'll lose the significance completely. If what you've got though is a true signal and you repeat the test, there is a good chance you will go below 05. 
That is certainly true, by the way, if you combined all the evidence together. So in other words, if you made a slightly bigger sample size, um, there's a good chance that you will go below the L5. But again, it doesn't matter. I, I said in a, uh, an earlier video, this is all about, it's practical, not statistical. This, in a way, fails the test, doesn't it? And you could just throw that knowledge in the bin and go, oh, the maths has told me that I've learned nothing. I'll throw it in the bin and start again. Why would you be that cavalier? This is just a tool to help you. What you should do, you got close, but no cigar. What's the next thing to do? Repeat it. Repeat the knowledge, repeat the shift. If you can do it again and again and again, the sample size will be such that the p-value will go and it will go significant. It'll go significant on you. These things aren't hard and fast rules. They're not kind of laws to be applied. You, you've convicted the process. You've, let the, you've proved that the process is innocent. I know that it's supposed to relate to a court of law. But this is a practical thing. If you really think that knowledge is true, repeat it and the maths will do the work. If it's true, it'll come with you. If it was luck, you can't be that lucky again and it'll go away from you. But these things have to be used in proper scientific processes. You do the test, you get the p-value, what do you do next? You do a confirmation test. This can still be wrong. Do a confirmation test. You can't be this lucky twice. If you do all of this and everything goes well, goes well, goes well, then you've got new knowledge and you can repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. You can use it to your benefit. If the benefit is to manufacture things better, faster, cheaper, beautiful, you're using statistics to help you make more money. We are not using statistics to pass tests. That's not the point. It's especially not the point in manufacturing. Use the tests, behave like a proper scientific engineer, of course. Use the tests in a proper, approach and then it'll be practical, real and useful and then you'll make more money and you'll improve your processes every single day and that's what we want you to do.